Good afternoon, YouTube. Good afternoon, YouTube. <laughs> Optimize screen sharing for video clip. Stereo. How does stereo sound? Good afternoon, YouTube. <laughs> Optimize screen sharing for video clip. Stereo. How does stereo sound? <laughs> Introduction to the reading of Hegel. Lectures on the phenomenology of spirit. Alexandra, Alexandri Kajib or Kojib. Kajiv. During the years 1933 to 1939, the Marxist political philosopher Alexandre Kajiv brilliantly explicated through a series of lectures the philosophy of Hegel as it was developed in the phenomenology of spirit based on the major work by Kajiv this collection of lectures was chosen by Bloom to show the intensity of Kajiv's study and thought and the depth of his insight into Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. More important for Kajiv was above all a philosopher and not an ideologue. This profound and venturesome work on Hegel will expose the readers to the excitement of discovering a great mind in all its force and power. Alexandra Kajiv was born in Russia and educated in Berlin. After World War II, he worked in the French Ministry of Economic Affairs as one of the chief planners for the common market, while also continuing his philosophical pursuits. Alan Bloom, who put it together, I believe, edited, is Professor of the Committee of Social Thought at the University of Chicago, is the editor, editor of Politics and the Arts, letter to M. D. Amblett on the Theatre by Jean Jacques Rousseau. <clears throat> An Angora paperback edition.
Has it got the types then? It's a serif. And uh, copy and paste doesn't pick up the letters properly because the serif bits are falling off. Gentlemen, we find ourselves in an important ep ep epoch in a fermentation. Well, I could do something like zoom it. That might make it a little bit easy. All right. And I should clean my glasses. Been out in the garden. <clears throat> we find ourselves in an important epoch in a fermentation in which spirit has made a leap forward has gone beyond its previous concrete form and acquired a new one. The whole mass of ideas and concepts that have been current until now, the very bonds of the world, are dissolving and collapsing into themselves like a vision in a dream. A new emergence of spirit is at hand. Philosophy must be the first to hail its appearance and recognise it while others resisting impotently adhere to the past and the majority unconsciously constitute the matter in which it makes its appearance. But philosophy, in recognising it as what is eternal, must pay homage to it. Homage. Hegel lectures at Jena of eighteen o six final speech. The courage of truth, faith in power of spirit, are the first conditions of philosophy. Man, because he is spirit, can and must consider him worthy of everything that is most sublime. He can never overestimate the greatness and power of his spirit. And if he has this faith, nothing will be so recalcitrant and hard as not to reveal itself to him. Hegel, 1816. Editor's introduction. Quenu's collection of Kajiv's thoughts about Hegel constitutes one of one of the few important philosophical books of the 20th century, a book knowledge of which is requisite to the full awareness of our situation and to grasp and to the grasp of the most modern perspective on the eternal questions of philosophy. A hostile critic has given an accurate assessment of Kajiv's influence. Kajiv is the unknown superior whose dogma is revered, often unawares, by that important subdivision of the animal kingdom of the spirit in the contemporary world, the, prog the progressivist intellectuals. In the years preceding the Second World War in France, the transmission was affected by means of oral initiation to a group of persons who in turn took the responsibility of instructing others and so on. It was only in 1947 that by the efforts of Raymond Quinu, Quen, Quenau, Quenu, the classes on the phenomenology of spirit taught by Alexandre Kajiv at the Ecole des It's a masculine pro it's a masculine article, I believe. Forties Etudes by from 1933 to 1939 were published under the title Introduction to the Reading of Hegel. This teaching was prior 
uh, was prior to the philosophico-political speculations of J.P. Sartre and M. Merleau-Ponty to the publication of Les Temps Moderns, Modernness and the New Orientation of a Spirit reviews, which were the most important vehicle for the dissemination of progressivist ideology in France after the liberation. From the, that time on, we have Breath Kajiv's teaching with the air of the times. It is known that intellectual progressivism itself admits of a subdivision since one ought to consider its two species. Christian a spirit and atheist the temps moderns. But this distinction, for reasons that the initial doctrine enables one to clarify, does not take on the importance of a schism. M. Kajiv is, so far as we know, the first to have attempted to constitute the intellectual and moral menage a trois of Hegel, Marx, and Heidegger which has since that time been such a great success. Amy. Dialectic du matri et de la esclave. Dialectic of the master and the slave. <clears throat> the contract social. 1961. Kajiv is the most thoughtful and most learned, the most profound of those Marxists who, dissatisfied with the thinness of Marx's account of the human and metaphysical grounds of his teaching, turned to Hegel as the truly philosophic source of that teaching. Although he made no effort at publicizing his reflections, the superior force of his interpretations imposed them willy-nilly on those who heard him. For this reason, anyone who wishes to understand the sense of that mixture of Marxism and existentialism, which characterizes contemporary radicalism, must turn to Kajiv. From him, one can learn both the implications and the necessary presuppositions of historicist philosophy. He elaborates what the... Well, that's a bit annoying. Did that go over a whole paragraph? He elaborates what the world must be like if terms such as freedom, work and creativity are to have a rational content and be part of a coherent understanding. It would then behoove any followers of the new version of the left who wishes to think through the meaning of his own action to study that thinker who is at its origin. However, Kajiv is above all a philosopher, which at the least means that he is primarily interested in the truth, the comprehensive truth. His passion for clarity is more powerful than his passion for changing the world. The charm of political solutions does not cause him to forget the need to present an adequate account of the rational basis of those solutions, and this removes him from the always distorted atmosphere of active commitment. He despises those intellectuals who respond to the demands of the contemporary audience and give the appearance of philosophic seriousness without raising the kinds of questions which would awe the audience or be repugnant to it. A certain sense of the inevitability of this kind of abuse, of the conversion of philosophy into ideology, is perhaps at the root of his distaste for publication. His work has been private and has, in large measure, 
been communicated only to friends. And the core of that work is the careful and scholarly study of Hegel. Because he's a serious man, Kajiv has never sought to be original and his originality has consisted in his search for the truth in the thought of wise men of the past. His interpretation has made Hegel an important alternative again and showed how much we have to learn from him at a time when he seems no longer of living significance. Yeah. Kajiv accomplished this revival of interest in Hegel, not by adapting him to make him relevant, but by showing that contemporary concerns are best understood in the permanent light of Hegel's teaching. Kajiv's book, is a model of textual interpretation. The book is suffused with the awareness that it is of pressing concern to find out precisely what such a thinker meant, for he may well know much more than we do about the things that we need to know. Here, scholarship is in the service of philosophy and Kajiv gives us a glimpse of the power of great minds and respect for the humble and unfashionable business of spending years studying an old book. His own teaching is but the distillation of more than six years devoted to nothing but reading a single book line by line. Introduction to the reading of Hegel constitutes the most authoritative interpretation of Hegel. Such a careful and comprehensive study, which makes sense of Hegel's very difficult texts, will be of great value in America, where though his influence has been great and is ever greater, very few people read, let alone understand him. He has regularly been ignored by academic positivists who are put off by his language and unaware and are unaware of the problems involved in their own understanding of science and the relation of science to the world of human concern. Hegel is now becoming popular in literary and artistic circles, but in a superficial, superficial form adapted to please dilant, 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 dilettantes and other seekers after a sense of depth who wish to use him rather than understand him. Kajiv presents he was teaching with a force and rigour which should counterpoise both tendencies. What distinguishes Kajiv's treatment of Hegel is the recognition that for Hegel, the primary concern is not the knowledge of anything outside of himself, be it of nature or history, but knowledge of himself, that is, knowledge of what the philosopher is and how he can know what he knows. The philosopher must be able to explain his own doings, an explanation of the heavens, of animals or of non-philosophic men, which does not leave room for, nor does not talk about the philosopher is radically incomplete because it cannot account for the possibility of its own existence as knowledge. The world known by philosophy must be such that it supports philosophy and makes the philosopher the highest or most complete kind of human being. Kajiv learned from Hegel that the philosopher seeks to know himself or to possess full self-consciousness, and that therefore the true philosophic endeavour is a coherent explanation of all things. That culminate in the explanation of philosophy. 
The man who seeks any other form of knowledge, who cannot explain his own doings, cannot be called a philosopher. Discussion of the rational state is only a corollary of the proof that the world can be known or is rational. Sajeev insists. A proposition that follows from and is often appended to one already proved, a direct or natural consequence or result. forming a proposition that follows from one already proved, associated or supplementary. Discussion of the rational state is only a corollary of the proof that the world can be known or is rational. Kajiv insists that Hegel is the only man who succeeded in making this proof and his interpretation of the phenomenology expands and clarifies Hegel's assertion that reality is rational and hence justifies rational discourse about it. According to Kajib, Hegel is the fulfillment of what Plato and Aristotle could only pray for. He is the modern Aristotle who responded to, or better incorporated, the objections made by Aristotelian philosophy by modern natural and human science. Kajiv intransigently, 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 intransigent, unwilling or refusing to change one's views or to agree about something. Intransigent, intransigently, Ajeev, intransigently, intransigently tries to make plausible Hegel's claim that he had achieved absolute wisdom. He argues that without the possibility of absolute wisdom, all knowledge, science or philosophy is impossible. It may indeed be doubted whether Kajib is fully persuasive to the modern consciousness, particularly since he finds himself compelled to abandon Hegel's philosophy of nature as indefensible and suggests that Heidegger's meditation on being may provide a substitute for it. The abandoned philosophy of nature may well be a necessary cosmic support for Hegel, Hegel's human The abandoned philosophy of nature may well be a necessary cosmic support for Hegel's human historical teaching. One might ask whether Kajiv is not really somewhat between Hegel and Heidegger, but it should be added that Kajiv himself leads the reader to this question, which is a proper theme of philosophical reflection. Kajiv describes the character of wisdom, even if he does not prove it has been actualized. Now, the most striking feature of Kajiv's thought is his insistence, fully justified, that for Hegel and for all followers of Hegel, history is completed, that nothing really new can again happen in the world. To most of us, such a position seems utterly paradoxical and wildly implausible. But Kajiv easily shows the ineluctable electable necessity. It's without argument. You can't argue against it, is that right? Oh, that's going to be handy. 
internet. Unable to be resisted or avoided, inescapable. But Kajiv easily shows the ineluctable necessity of his consequence for anyone who understands human life to be historically determined for anyone who believes that thought is relative to time, that is, for most modern men. For if thought is historical, it is only at the end of history that this fact can be known. There can only be knowledge if history at some point stops. Kajiv elaborates the meaning of this logical necessity throughout the course of the book and attempts to indicate how a sensible man could accept it and interpret the world in accordance with it. It is precisely Marx's failure to think through the meaning of his own historical thought that proves his historical inadequacy compels us to turn to the profounder Hegel. If concrete historical reality is all that the human mind can know, if there is no transcendent intelligible world, then for there to be philosophy or science, reality must have become rational. The Hegelian solution accepted by Kajiv is that this has indeed happened and that the enunciation of the universal rational principles of the rights of man in the French Revolution marked the beginning of the end of history. Thereafter, these are the only acceptable, viable principles of the state. The dignity of man has been recognized and all men are understood to participate in it. All that remains to do is at most to realize the state grounded on these principles all over the world. No antithesis. can undermine this synthesis, which contains within itself all the valid possibilities. In this perspective, Kajiv interprets our situation. He paints a powerful picture of our problems as those of post-historical man with none of the classic tasks of history to perform living in a universal homogenous state where there is virtual agreement on all the fundamental principles of science, politics, and religion. He characterizes the life of the man who is free, who has no work, who has no worlds to conquer, states to found, gods to revere, or truths to discover. In so doing, Kajiv gives an example of what it means to follow out the necessity of one's position manfully and philosophically. If Kajiv is wrong, if his world does not correspond to the real one, we learn at least that either one must abandon reason, and this includes all science, or one must abandon historicism. More commonsensical but less intransigent writers would not teach us nearly so much. Not changing their mind. I'm willing to refuse to change one's views or agree to something. More commonsensical, but less intransigent. Freya. 
and with their changing of minds, writers could not teach us nearly so much. Kajiv presents the essential outlines of historical thought and to repeat historical thought in one form or another is at the root of almost all modern human science. It is concerning the characterization of man at the end of history that one of the most intriguing difficulties in Kajiv's teaching arises. As is only to be expected, his honesty and clarity led him to pose the difficulty himself. If Hegel is right that history fulfills the demands of reason, the citizen of the final state should enjoy the satisfaction of all reasonable human aspirations. He should be a free, rational being, content with his situation and exercising all of his powers, emancipated from the bonds of prejudice and oppression. But looking around us, Kajiv, like every other penetrating observer, sees that the completion of the human task may very well coincide with the decay of humanity, the re-barbarization or even re-animalization of man. He addresses this problem particularly in the note on Japan added to the second edition. After reading it, one wonders whether the citizen of the universal homogenous state is not identical to Nietzsche's last man and whether Hegel's historicism does not by an, in, in, by an inevitable dialectic force us to a more somber and more radical historicism which rejects reason. We are led to a confrontation between Hegel and Nietzsche and perhaps even further towards a reconsideration of the classical philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, who rejected historicism before the facts and whom Hegel believed had he had surpassed. It is the special merit of Kajiv to be one of the very few sure guides to the contemplation of the fundamental alternatives. Shortly after the completion of this statement, I learned that Kajiv had died in Brussels, May 68. That's when the student riots were on May, when they had nearly had a revolution. Well, they did, but it swung back. Translator's note. The original French edition of introduction a la lecture de Hegel consists of notes and transcripts of lectures delivered by Alexandre Kojeev from 1933 to 1939 at the Ecole de uh, Hortis Etudes collected and edited by the poet and novelist Raymond Quineau of the Académie Concord. Its first chapter and the first in this translation was written by Kajiv and published in the January 14, 1939 issue of Measures, Messieurs. The present translation includes slightly under one half of the original volume. The passages translated correspond to those pages of the French text. The selection for this edition were made with two goals in mind, to present the outlines of Kajiv's interpretation of the phenomenology of spirit and to present the most characteristic aspects of his own thought. The translation tries to preserve as much as possible of Kajiv's style and terminology, which are determined at least in part by his careful attempt to preserve and explain the meaning of Hegel's own precise terminology. Some of the oddities consequently present, present 
in the translation should perhaps be mentioned. Many of Kajiv's translations of Hegel's terms are not the customary ones, but represent his interpretation of their meaning. For example, he renders moment, cyan, in one of its meanings, and wesson as element element constitutive atre etre doni and reality essentially essentially essential these interpretations are maintained in the english as constituent element given being an essential reality Kajiv often translates single words of Hegel by several words joined with hyphens. This is sometimes being followed in the translation, but at other times, when great awkwardness or confusion might result, it has not. Kajiv's use of capitalization has been preserved throughout. Kajiv has also invented several French words, thus making it necessary to invent some English ones such as thingness or society for ding height and nihilate for neantier. Of course, it is often impossible to use consistently one translation for each French term. To give two or many examples, supremia, supreme or of heaven, has usually been translated overcome, but sometimes do away with, and sentiment, de soy, or selbst, gefahl, has been translated sentiment of self but sometimes sentiment is translated feeling page and line references to Hegel's phenomenology of spirit are to the Hofmeister edition Hamburg Felix Minor Verlag Citations of other works of Hegel are from the Lasson Hofmeister edition, Leipzig, Felix Mina, Verlag, 1905. I should like to express my thanks to Kenley and Krista Dove, who kindly made available for this edition their translation of Kajiv's structure of the phenomenology of spirit and their correlation of the page and line references to J.B. Bailey's English translation, The Phenomenology of Mind, which will be of great usefulness to the English reader, say appendix. I'm obliged to the Danforth Foundation for a summer grant that enabled me to complete the revision of the translation Finally, I should like to thank my mother for her considerable help with various stages of the manuscript. James H. Nicholas, Nichols, Jr. In place of an introduction. Summary of this for first six chapters of the Phenomenology of Spirit. Complete text of the first three lectures of the academ academic year 1937-38. Summary of the course in 1937-98. Excerpts from the 1938-39 and Nori of the Ecole Pratique des Hortes Etudes. Etudes section des sciences religiouses philosophy and wisdom complete text of the first two lectures of the academic year 38 39 a note on eternity time and the concept 
complete text of the sixth through eighth lectures of the academic year 38-39. Interpretation of the third part of chapter eight of the Phenomenology of Spirit. Conclusion, complete text of the 12th lecture of the academic year 38-39. The dialectic of the real and the phenomenological method in Hegel. Complete text of the sixth through the ninth lectures of the academic year 34 to 35. Appendix, the structure of the phenomenology of spirit. In place of an introduction, a translation with commentary of section A of chapter four of the Phenomenology of Spirit entitled Autonomy and Dependence of Self-Consciousness, Mastery and Slavery. The commentary in, is in brackets. Words joined by hyphens correspond to a single German word. Hegel, er, fast, die, arbeit, else, das, wessen, else, das, sich, be, waren, die, wessen, des, men, menschen, Man is self-conscious. He is conscious of himself, conscious of his human reality and dignity. And it is in this that he is essentially different from animals, which do not go beyond the level of simple sentiment of self. Man becomes conscious of himself at the moment when, for the first time, he says, I, to understand man by understanding his origin, is therefore to understand the origin of the I revealed by speech. What's up, Pussy Cat? What's that pussy cat? Do you want to go outside? Oh, I'll get you straight in the eyeball then. Do you want to go outside or sit on my lap? I'm standing on my badges, darling. No, darling. Yucky. Mwah. You want to go outside? That will enable me to shut the front door. Rah. Rah. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Ah. Not any more, please. Hmm. 
now the analysis of thought, reason, understanding, and so on, in general, of the cognitive, contemplative, passive behavior of a being or a knowing subject never reveals the why or the how of the birth of the word I and consequently of self-consciousness, that is, of the human reality. The man who contemplates is absorbed by what he contemplates. The knowing subject loses himself in the object that is known. Contemplation reveals the object, not the subject. The object and not the subject is what shows itself to him in and by, or better, as the act of knowing. The man who is absorbed by the ob object that he is contemplating can be brought back to himself only but by a desire, by the desire to eat, for example, the conscious desire of a being is what constitutes that being as I and reveals it as such by moving it to say I. Desire is what transforms being, revealed to itself by itself in true knowledge into and object revealed to a subject by a subject different from the object and opposed to it. It is in and by, or better still, as his desire that man is formed and is revealed to himself and to others as an I, as the I that is essentially different from and radically opposed to the non-I. The human eye is the eye of a desire or of desire. The very being of man, the self-conscious being, therefore, implies and presupposes desire. Consequently, the human reality can be formed and maintained only within a biological reality and animal life. But if animal desire is the necessary condition of self-consciousness, it is not the sufficient condition. By itself, this desire constitutes only the sentiment of self. In contrast to the knowledge that keeps man in a passive quietude, desire disquiets him and moves him to action. Born of desire, action tends to satisfy it and can do so only by the negation, the destruction, or at least the transformation of the desired object to satisfy hunger, for example, the food must be destroyed or, in any case, transformed. Thus, all action is negating. Far from leaving the given as it is, action destroys it, if not in its being, at least in its given form. And all negating negativity with respect to the given is necessarily active. But negating action is not purely destructive. For if action destroys an object reality for the sake of satisfying the desire from which it is born, 
it creates in its place in and by that very destruction a subjective reality. The being that eats, for example, creates and preserves its own reality by the overcoming of a reality other than its own, by the transformation of an alien reality into its own reality, by the assimilation, the internalization of a foreign external reality. <coughs> Generally speaking, the eye of desire is an emptiness that receives a real positive content only by negating action that satisfies desire in destroying, transforming and assimilating the desired non-I. And the positive content of the eye constituted by negation is a function of the positive content of the negated non-I. If then the desire is directed toward a neutral, natural non-I, the I too will be natural. The I created by the active satisfaction of such a desire will have the same nature as the things towards which toward which that desire is directed the eye created by the active satisfaction of such a desire will have the same nature as the things toward which that desire is directed it will be a thingish eye a merely living eye, an animal eye, and this natural eye a function of the natural object can be revealed to itself and to others only as sentiment of self. It will never attain self-consciousness. For there to be self-consciousness, desire must therefore be directed toward a non-natural object, towards something that goes beyond the given reality. Now, the only thing that goes beyond the given reality is desire itself. For desire taken as desire, that is, before its satisfaction is but a revealed nothingness, an unreal emptiness, desire being the revelation of an emptiness, the presence of the absence of a reality is something essentially different from the desired thing, something other than a thing, than and than a static and given real being that stays eternally identical to itself. Therefore, desire directed towards another desire, taken as desire, will create by the negating and assimilating action that satisfies it, and it, an I essentially different from the animal I. This I which feeds on desires will itself be desire in its very being created in and by the satisfaction of its desire. And since desire is realized as action, negating the given, the very being of this I will be action. This I will not, like the animal I, be identity or equally 
equality to itself, but negating ne negativity. In other words, the very being of this I will be becoming, and the universal form of this being will not be space, but time. Therefore, <clears throat> its continuation in existence will signify for this I not to be what it is, a static and given being as natural being, as innate character, and to be, that is, to become what it is not. Thus, this I will be its own product. It will be in the future what it has become by negation in the present of what it was in the past, this negation being accomplished with a view to what will be, what will become. In its very being, this I is intentional becoming, deliberate evolution, conscious and voluntary progress. It is the act of transcending the given that is given to it and that is that it itself is. This I is a human individual free with respect to the given real and historical in relation to itself. And it is this I and only this I that reveals itself to itself and to others as self-consciousness. Human desire must be directed toward another desire. For there to be human desire, then there must first be a multiplicity of animal desires. In other words, in order that self-consciousness be born from the sentiment of self, in order that the human reality come into being within the animal reality, this reality must... <clears throat> be essentially manifold. Manifold. <laughs> many or various, having many different forms or elements. Mm. This reality must be essentially manifold. Therefore, man can appear on earth only within a herd. That is why the human reality can only be social. But for the herd to become a so society, multiplicity of desires is not sufficient by itself. In addition, the desires of each member of the herd must be directed or potentially directed toward the desires of the other members. If the human reality is a social reality, society is human only as a set of desires, mutually desiring one another as desires. Human desire, or better still, anthropogenic, gentic, anthropogenic desire produces a free and historical individual. Conscious of his individuality, his freedom, his history, and finally his historic historicity. Hence, anthropogenetic desire is different from animal desire which produces a natural being merely living and having only a sentiment of its life in that it is directed not towards a real positive given object but toward another desire 
thus in the relationship between man and woman, for example, desire is human only if the one desires, not the body, but the desire of the other. If he wants to possess or to assimilate the desire taken as desire, that is to say, if he wants to be desired or loved, or rather re recognized in his human value, in his reality as a human individual. Likewise, desire directed toward a natural object is human only to the extent that it is mediated by the desire of another directed towards the same object. Toward. It is human to desire what others desire because they desire it. Thus, an object perfectly useless from the biological point of view, such as a medal or the enemy's flag, can be desired because it is the object of other desires. Such a desire can only be a human desire but, and human reality as distinguished from animal reality is created only by action that satisfies such desires. Human history is the history of desired desires. But apart from this difference, which is essential, human desire is analogous to animal desire. Human desire too tends to satisfy itself by a negating or better, a transforming and assimilating action. Man feeds on desires as an animal feeds on real things. And the human eye realized by the active satisfaction of its human desires is as much a function of its food as the body of an animal is of its food. For man to be truly human, for him to be essentially and really different from an animal, his human desire must actually win out over his animal desire. Now, all desire is desire for a value. The supreme value for an animal is its animal life. All the desires of an animal are in the final analysis a function of its desire to preserve its life. Human desire, therefore, must win out over this desire for preservation. In other words, man's humanity comes to light only if he risks his animal life for the sake of his human desire. It is in and by this risk that the human reality is created and revealed as re reality. It is in and by this risk that it comes to light, that is, is shown, demonstrated, verified, and gives proof of being essentially different from the animal natural reality. And that is... And that is why to speak of the origin of self-consciousness is necessarily to speak of the risk of life for an essential non-vital end. Man's humanity comes to light only in risking his life to satisfy his human desire, that is, his desire directed toward another desire. Now, to desire a desire is to want a, to substitute one, oneself for the value desired by this desire. For without this substitution, one would desire the value, the desired object, 
and not the desire itself. Therefore, to desire the desire of another is in the final analysis to desire that the value that I am or that I represent be the value desired by the other. I want him to recognize my value as his value. I want him to recognize me as an autonomous value. In other words, all human anthropogenetic desire, the desire that generates self-consciousness, the human reality, is finally a function of the desire for recognition and the risk of life by which the human reality comes to light is a risk for the sake of such a desire. Therefore, to speak of the origin of self-consciousness is necessarily to speak of a fight to the death for recognition. Without this fight to the death for pure prestige, there would never have been human beings on earth. Indeed, the human being is formed only in terms of a desire directed toward another desire, that is, finally, in terms of a desire for recognition. Therefore, the human being can be formed only if at least two of these desires confront one another. Each of the two beings endowed with such a desire is ready to go all the way in pursuit of its satisfaction. That is, it is ready to risk its life and consequently to put the life of the other in danger in order to be recognized by the other to impose itself on the other as the supreme value. Accordingly, their meeting can only be a fight to the death. And it is only in and by such a fight that the human reality is begotten, formed, realized and revealed to itself and to others. Therefore, it is realized and revealed only as recognized reality. However, if all men, or more exactly, all beings in the process of becoming human beings behaved in the same manner, the fight would necessarily end in the death of one of the adversaries or of both. It would not be possible for one to give way to the other, to give up the fight before the death of the other, to recognize the other instead of being recognized by him. But if this were the case, the realization and the Uh, the revelation of the human being would be impossible. This is obvious in the case of death of both adversaries, since the human reality being essentially desire and action in terms of desire can be born and maintained only within an animal life. But it is equally impossible when only one of the adversaries is killed, for with him disappears that other desire toward which desire must be directed in order to be a human desire. The survivor, unable to be recognized by the dead adversary, cannot realize and reveal his humanity in order that the human being be realized and revealed as self-consciousness. Therefore, it is not sufficient that the nascent, nas, nascent human reality be manifold. This multiplicity, this society, must in addition imply two essentially different human or anthropogenetic 
behaviors. In order that the human reality come into being as recognized reality, both adversaries must remain alive after the fight. Now, this is possible only on the condition that they behave differently in this fight by irreducible or better by unforeseeable or undeducible acts of liberty they must constitute themselves as unequals in and by this very fight without being predestined to it in any way the one must fear the other must give in to the other, must refuse to risk his life for the satisfaction of his desire for recognition. He must give up his desire and satisfy the desire for the other. He must give. Without being predestined to it in any way, the one must fear the other, must give in to the other, must refuse to risk his life for the satisfaction of his desire for recognition. He must give up his desire and satisfy the desire of the other. He must recognize the other without being recognized by him. Now, to recognize him thus is to recognize him as his master and to recognize himself to be recognized as the master's slave. In other words, in his nascent state, man is never simply man. He is always necessarily and essentially either master or slave. If the human reality can come into being only as a social reality, society is human, at least in its origin, only on the basis of its implying an element of mastery and an element of slavery, of autonomous existences and dependent existences. And that is why to speak of the origin of self-consciousness is necessarily to speak of the autonomy and dependence of self-consciousness, of mastery and slavery. If the human being is begotten only in and by the fight that ends in the relation between master and slave, the progressive realisation and re revelation of this being can themselves be affected only in terms of this fundamental social relation. If man is nothing but his becoming, if his human existence in space is his existence in time or as time, if the revealed human reality is nothing but universal history, That history must be the history of the interaction between mastery and slavery. The historical dialectic is the dialectic of master and slave. But if the opposition of thesis and antithesis is meaningful only in the context of their reconciliation by synthesis, if history in the full sense of the word necessarily has a final term if man who becomes must culminate in man who has become if desire must end in satisfaction if the science of man must possess the quality of a definitively and universally valid truth the interaction of master and slave must finally end in the dialectical overcoming of both of them However, that may be the human reality can be begotten and preserved only as recognized reality. 
It is only by being recognized by another, by many others, or in the extreme by all others, that a human being is really human for himself as well as for others. And only in speaking of a recognized human reality can the term human be used to state a truth in the strict and full sense of the term. For only in this case can one reveal a reality in speech. That is why it is necessary to say this of self-consciousness, of self-conscious man. Self-consciousness exists in and for itself, in and by the fact that it exists in and for itself. For another self-consciousness, that is, it exists only as an entity that is recognized. This pure concept of recognition of the doubling of self-consciousness within its unity must now be considered as its evolution appears to self-consciousness, that is, not to the philosopher who speaks of it, but to the self-conscious man who recognizes another man or is recognized by him. In the first place, this evolution will make manifest the aspect of the inequality between the two self-consciousnesses, that is, between the two men who confront one another for the sake of recognition, or the expansion of the middle term, which is the mutual and reciprocal recognition into the two extremes, which are the two who confront one another. These are opposed to one another as extremes, the one only recognize, the other only recognizing. To begin with, the man who wants to be recognized by another in no sense wants to recognize him in turn. If he succeeds, then the recognition will not be mutual and reciprocal. He will be recognized, but will not recognize the one who recognizes him. To begin with, self-consciousness is simple or undivided being for itself. It is identical to itself by excluding from itself everything other than itself. Its essential reality and its absolute object are, for it, I, I isolated from everything and opposed to everything that is not I. And in this immediacy, in this given being, i.e. being that is not produced by an active creative process of its being for itself, Self-consciousness is particular and isolated. To begin with, self-consciousness is simple or undivided being for itself. It is identical to itself by excluding from itself everything other than itself. Its essential reality and its absolute object are for it, I. I isolated from everything and opposed to everything that is not I. And in this immediacy, in this given being, that is being that is not produced by an active creative process of its being for itself, self-consciousness is particular and isolated. What is other for it exists as an object without essential reality. as an object marked with the character of a negative entity. But in the case we are studying, the other entity too is a self-consciousness. 
a human individual comes face to face with a human individual, meeting thus immediately, these individuals exist for one another as common objects. They are autonomous concrete forms, consciousness submerged in the given being of animal life. For it is as animal life that the merely existing object has here presented itself. They are consciousnesses that have not yet accomplished for one another the dialectical movement of absolute abstraction, which consists in the uprooting of all immediate given being and in being nothing but the purely negative or negating given being of the consciousness that is identical to itself. Or in other words, these are entities that have not yet manifested themselves to one another as pure being for itself, that is, of self-consciousness. The one sees in the other only an animal and a dangerous and hostile one at that, that is to be destroyed and not a self-conscious being representing an autonomous value. Each of these two human individuals is, to be sure, subjectively certain of himself, but he is not certain of the other. And that is why his That is why his own subjective certainty of himself does not yet possess truth. That is, it does not yet reveal a reality or in other words, an entity that is objectively intersubjectively, that is universally recognized and hence existing and valid. Or in other words, these are entities that have not yet manifested themselves to one another as pure being for itself, that is, as self-consciousness. When the first two men confront one another for the first time, the one sees the other only as animal and a dangerous and hostile one at that. That is to be destroyed and not a self-conscious being representing an autonomous value. Each of these two human individuals is, to be sure, subjectively certain of himself, but he is not certain of the other. And that is why his own subjective certainty of himself does not yet possess truth. That is, it does not yet reveal a reality, or in other words, an entity that is objectively intersubjectively, that is, universally recognized and hence existing and valid. For the truth of his subject certainty of the idea that he has for him of himself, of the value that he attributes to himself could have been nothing but the fact that his own being for itself was manifested to him as an autonomous object. Or again, to say the same thing, the fact that the object was manifested to him as this pure subjective certainty of himself. Therefore, he must find the private idea that he has of himself in the external objective reality. But according to the concept of recognition, this is possible only if he accomplishes for the other, just as the other does for him, the pure abstraction of being for itself. Each accomplishing it in himself, both by his own activity and also by the other's activity. The first man who meets another man for the first time 
already attributes an autonomous absolute reality and an autonomous absolute value to himself. We can say that he believes himself to be a man, that he has the subject certainty of being a man, but his certainty is not yet knowledge. The value that he attributes to himself could be illusory. The idea that he has of himself could be false or mad. For the idea to be a truth, it must reveal an objective reality that is an entity that is valid and exists not only for itself, but also for realities other than itself. In the case in question, man is to be really truly man and to know that he is such must therefore impose the idea that he has of himself of himself on beings other than himself. He must be recognized by the others in the ideal extreme case by all the others. Or again, he must transform the natural and human world in which he is not recognized into a world in which this recognition takes place. This transformation of the world that is hostile to a human project into a world in harmony with this project is called action. Activity. This action essentially human because humanizing and anthropogenetic will begin with the act of imposing oneself on the first other man one meets. And since this other, if he is, or more exactly, if he wants to be and believes himself to be a human being, must himself do the same thing. The first anthropogenetic action necessarily takes the form of a fight a fight to the death between two beings that claim to be men, a fight for pure prestige carried on for the sake of recognition by the adversary indeed. The manifestation of the human individual taken as pure abstraction of being for itself consists in showing itself as being the pure negation of its objective or thingish mode of being. Or in other words, in showing that to be for oneself or to be a man is not to be bound to any determined existence, not to be bound to the universal isolated particularity of existence as such, not to be bound to life. Hello, Pussycat. What are you up to? He says, you want to go outside now? You sure? You sure, Pussycat? You sure, sure? Let me move them out there. You'd be more space to annoy, mate. You're not annoying, my little man there. Uh, uh. 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 You want to get on my name? Hey? You want to get on my name? You want to get on my name? Oh, 
Teste. How long have I been going? 89 minutes. I think I might stop at this point. So there. I've got a cat disturber. What's today? Sunday. Out the way, pussy cat. December and uh, 1919. And 19 seconds? No, 